What's good, Des Moines? Welcome to another episode of Invitation by Invictus. Today, I have my fantastic friends here from Green State Credit Union. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves because A, I don't want to butcher it. And two, I think I should give them the room to talk. So I'm going to start off with Kenya first and then we can switch over to Lindsay. How's that? Perfect. Well, thank you so much for having us. I'm yeah. really excited and looking forward to the conversation. Uh, Kenya Calderon Ceron. I am the VP of Bilingual Business Development yes. at Green State. And oh, what is there to say? I am uh, an immigrant originally born in El Salvador. Okay. And I have been in Des Moines since I was 11. So okay. Des Moines has been home for me yeah. for the last 17 years. And heavily involved in the immigrant and Latino communities, community yeah. space, which ties nicely with the role that I have at Green State. For sure. And Lindsay, for the, for the viewer that doesn't know anything about you, tell us about you. Well, I am Lindsay Kennedy. I am the vice president of business development at Green State, okay. so Kenya's counterpart. Yes. I grew up here in Des Moines. Des Moines is home. I feel like uh, Iowa raised me. And yes, um, I love all things about Iowa and the black community in Iowa and how strong yes. and how there is such a rich culture and history here. Mm -hmm. So my role is really focused on our affordable home loan program yes. and decreasing the gap in home ownership between black and brown community members okay. and everyone else. Um, like I said, Iowa has a rich history here for mm -hmm. people of color, but there are some issues that are not being addressed and that haven't been addressed. And Green State is very focused on addressing those issues. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Cause I don't think people really know. I mean, people kind of, but not really. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you guys brought us in like I would, like a month ago to come shoot your event. Your, it's now a yearly event, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the name of it has changed and it's morphed because you guys have found out that there's there's a higher need out there for, for what you're trying to do. So like kind of, you know, again, for the average viewer that doesn't know, kind of walk us through what that is. Yes. So we as a financial institution, uh, have acknowledged that there are disparities in mm -hmm. our industry that um, we can no longer ignore. So our event was, we're not calling it a community celebration where we bring uh, nonprofit leaders, just leaders in the communities that we're trying to serve to come together and just have a space for us to exchange ideas, yeah. to celebrate the work that they've done throughout the entire year. And um, as Lindsay mentioned, some of the disparities that we're trying to address with our community partners is the homeownership uh, gap, um, underserved rates uh, for folks that are unbanked mm -hmm. or underbanked. Yes. And um, so we do all of this work to be able to ensure that Iowans, speci specifically Iowans of color, have access to financial services. Right. And um, I think it's easy for us to just talk about the work and, and continue to do it every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why our event has turned into an annual uh, series, uh, because I, I think it's also important about to acknowledge the work that has been done and celebrate it. Correct. Right? Correct. Well, and their work really complements what we're doing. We would not be successful and we cannot continue to have success without the community support and without those community partners really leaning in and telling us what's going on, what are they seeing, what do they need from us? Yeah. Um, and not so much us telling the community what they need, mm -hmm. but really listening and allowing them to help us evolve and grow the programs that we have and the services that we provide. And having that in, uh, or having that input makes us, I feel like, more well-rounded in providing holistic financial support. Right, right. Like I had um, Aubrey from uh, Eat Greater Des Moines. Mm -hmm. They serve a population that a lot of people don't really want to touch, right? I feel like that's kind of what Green State's doing, right? Like gr you guys created, and this is what I learned at your event. I actually paid attention. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, that you guys created a program for the true unbanked, right? Mm -hmm. People that don't have documentation but they got a plethora of cash, mm -hmm. but they can't, they can't bank. They can't rent because they don't have proper documentation. Right. So you guys helped created a program, I believe that gets people to buy their first house, mm -hmm. right. Or give them banking services that nobody else wants to touch. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's kind of a two pronged approach. So okay. we have our affordable home loan program that is targeting people of color. Okay. Uh, people of color. We're, the goal is to try to get them into home ownership. Mm -hmm. um, the program is considered a special purpose credit program. So we do have a different uh, guidelines. Okay. But even though the guidelines are slightly relaxed, the goal is to make sure that the person is ready for home ownership. Okay. So we're not just going to put someone in a home. No. Yeah. Right? Like if yeah. they don't qualify, they don't qualify, but we're walking alongside of them and helping them to get there. And like, then how, how is that happening though? So we're providing credit counseling. Got it. So if a person today is not approved for that home ownership program, okay. Green State will put them, uh, will partner them with a credit counselor and okay. we'll pay for that service. Oh, but what okay. we, we're not um, requiring them to check in with us. We're not requiring them to have other services with us. It's truly really supporting them for their goals and their dreams with the hope that they will come back to us, that they yes. will remember that support that we provided Yes, and seek out additional financial products and services. Okay. And then I'll say the other side of um, our initiatives are really focused on I-10 lending and I-10 products. So yes. you, you want to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. So when we look at underserved markets, we can take a look at different factors that are going into why they don't have a formal relationship with a financial institution. Yeah. Some of them can be socioeconomic status. It could be uh, distance to an actual location where they can or language to. barrier language barrier is yeah. another one mm -hmm. and then another one that we started looking into is legal status okay so what i mean with that is that we'll have folks that are that don't have any uh they're not u.s citizens today they are immigrants here working um, yeah. and filing their taxes under an i-10 number which stands for an individual um Individual identific identification. Oh, let me back up. Oh my god, I think I'm, I talk about this all the time. Individual <laughs> taxpayer identification yes. number. Okay, and so um, those are the folks that you know. When we think of immigrants, some people may think like, "Oh, they just you know they arrived to the United States five years ago." But no. in reality, no. we're talking about people that have been here thirty years. Yeah, and they just have not had a path to citizenship yet. Mm -hmm. So they continue to live quote unquote under shadows or even excluded from uh, your mainstream financial services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we uh, work to put together an item lending program where folks that don't have a social security number today, uh, but they file their taxes, they have this identification number, uh, can come to us, open an account, build credit, and ultimately uh, also become homeowners. Yes, uh, first-time home homeowners. Most yes, first-time homeowners. Right? Yes, most likely. And um, so it, it just complements it in a way that I think other credit unions have tried to do it, but I think Greenstead has taken a holistic approach yeah. to truly mm -hmm. look like we're not just going to do this and be like, okay, we're done. It's looking at every single piece of the puzzle as to why people are underserved. And where, what do you guys have found in, in that search? Like why it's so un, like underserved, like what is it? Well, I would say, I think the biggest thing, um, the biggest barrier for people of color is trust. Okay. Yes, that's what I was going to say. We're, <laughs> we're on the same. Yes. It, it really is trust and trusting that if I put my life savings, if I put my money yeah. into your institution, one, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. How is it going to help support my family? And also financial literacy is key, right? Okay. If you don't have a banking relationship established at 18, okay. you're less likely to have the tools to know how to operate it, how to use it and okay. how to take advantage of it. That's statistically proven, right? Yes. Like yeah. it's like your chance if you don't have something by 18, it just significantly decreases. Mm -hmm. Well, and even just the financial literacy early on, because if you don't see your parents in engaging in the banking system, okay. you know, are you going to want to use it? Are you going to want to, because we emulate what our families do, right? Yeah. For the most it's part, generational. It's generational. Yes. So I think back to the earliest time of seeing my mom write a check okay. and asking questions around like, well, why? You know, yeah. like, what, what are you doing at the grocery store writing a check? We don't do that anymore now, nope. right? Nope. Now we use debit cards. Yep. Kids ask those questions, why? Okay. And what's it for? And, you know, it's, we want to know mm -hmm. how to be successful and financial literacy is key in that success. So are you guys like putting, putting like financial literacy classes inside of schools? 
No. So we're taking a different approach. Okay. We're, um, we're looking at nonprofits that are already servicing the communities that we're trying to serve okay. and partnering with them so that the trust that they have already built with these nonprofits mm-hmm. and service providers mm-hmm can be transmitted over to us because if an immigrant is going to get legal services from a nonprofit and they're trusting them with something very vulnerable, correct? and then they see that we're also working with this, this nonprofit, then yeah. it's like we're sharing and also uh, being intentional about coming to them and not waiting for them to come yeah. to us. Okay. And to your point, because sometimes people do ask like, well, you're going to schools, right? Right now, our target market is really those folks, those, those parents, they are the older immigrants that are already, you know, probably in their fifties and they don't have, they've never owned a home yet. Yeah. And I think to your point, the, the trust, when I think of the immigrant community, we inherit a fear of financial institutions because immigrants or refugees may come from countries that don't have the same banking system that we have in the United States. No. Yeah. It's very different. Super different. And sometimes um, in some countries, depending on the country, financial institutions are not insured, uh, are not regulated the way that we are in the United States. So yeah. Case in point, China, because everything collapsed in the last six months there. Yes. And Mm so, when we talk about generations, you may have somebody that's a child of immigrants, they're U.S. citizens, and they might still be fearful of financial institutions, institutions even though they don't know why. Yeah. And so uh, that's why being intentional about the type of partnerships that we build is so yeah. important yeah. to build that trust and to also make sure that our institution looks and represents the community that we are trying to serve. And we hear that in a lot of DEI spaces, but for us, it's very important because talking about money is a very vulnerable conversation to have. Money, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, makes the world go round as much as we don't say Mm -hmm. that, but it is right. So if you don't have any money, then you don't have any chance and no chance Mm -hmm. equals no hope. Yeah. Right. So, so if you don't have that pipeline, then how can you survive? Yeah. And it's like having a conversation about your finances with somebody that's going to understand cultural practices yeah. that are going to be relevant mm-hmm. to you is so important yeah. too. I would say you guys are yeah. super, super diverse, like your organization as a whole. Mm-hmm. I'd say we're, we're getting there. We're yeah. getting there. There's definitely a lot of work to be done. And, you know, the, um, the space that we occupy, though, it's so important. So mm-hmm. a lot of the conversations around recruitment and strategy is really going back to making careers in financial services an ideal career for people of color and marginalized people to be in. Mm-hmm. Because one thing about um, people, if you can't see yourself there, yeah, there's no vision, there's no dream, right? And for people of color, I, I can imagine, and one of the things that I used to believe when I was younger was that you had to have money to work at a financial institution. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a huge myth. That's a huge myth. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, here here in Iowa, like when you look across uh, the uh, financial services landscape, there are very few lenders of color. Um, oh, yeah. Well, and, yeah, for I sure. I mean, even more so, there are very few black mm-hmm. lenders of color. Mm-hmm. It uh, I know of maybe two in the Des Moines area, but they work mm-hmm. in call center. So they're not front facing. They're oh, not, really? They're not, you're, they're not someone you can walk in the door and sit down with yeah. and talk to about getting a mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. I, the unfortunate part is, you know, I'm a transplant. So I've lived on both coasts. You know, I've lived on the West Coast the longest. You know, I come from many hubs of diversity, right? And I come from a home of like, you know, it was a trilingual household, Korean, Italian, and English, right? So I grew up in that. And then I come to Iowa, which essentially is 96% population white. And it's very different for me. And I've told my partner who, you know, she's white and is like, Iowa needs more culture. It needs more diversity. You know, like when, when we travel... I make sure my kids get a piece of mm-hmm. of that culture and diversity wherever we are. I make sure that these kids understand what Korean barbecue is. So, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Hunter, what's your favorite food when we eat out? 
Uh, my favorite that we've had. Yes. Yeah. Either Korean barbecue or Garozos. Yeah, Italian. Can't, yeah. can't go wrong with the Guidos. Mm. But, you know, I always make sure we go somewhere outside of Iowa that's not in Iowa that has some sort of diversity and culture inside of it. So that, because I feel like that's just missing here. Yeah. And it can be very lonely if you think about it. If you are For sure. um, in these spaces and something that, Lindsay and I are a department of two. Yes. And um, I, I, one of the characteristics that I really appreciate about us that I think we both are on the same page is that we don't speak for an entire community. No. Yeah. yeah. We, we can't. Yes. I have my own experiences as, as an immigrant that's not going to be relatable to every single immigrant in Des Moines. No. And same thing for, for Lindsay. But you guys have a foundation. Absolutely. You yes. have a foundation that people can relate on. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that even just with people relating, they, uh, they understand the authenticity of what we're, how we speak and what we're talking about. We don't speak for everyone. Right. But we have listened to those community voices. We do have that experience serving our community. And that's one great thing that even before both of us came to green state, we were working in this community. Mm -hmm. We had community relationships that were authentic and genuine and really help to enrich our knowledge of what's going on in central Iowa mm -hmm. and the ways that people need to position themselves and businesses need to position themselves to correct and address. Okay. So what can we do to help? What are the things that people like the viewer out there, what can they do to help to, to help in any, any capacity in any way, whether it's, you know, I guess showing up, volunteering, donating what what can they do well my first thought is awareness is key, okay right being aware that there is a wealth equity gap in this state that for is one sure. of the, we're in like the top 10 for people of color and their white counterparts okay so just being aware of that okay and thinking about what space in the community do you occupy that you can support that okay so like if you work an example would be if you're in healthcare, right okay how can you support that wealth equity gap? Bringing awareness to healthcare screenings and things that will decrease people's, um, de decrease the chances of them ending up in the emergency room and uh, incurring a high bill. Okay. Right. How can you advocate for in insurance for people of low means or marginalized communities so that they can actually go to the doctor and get, have those preventative screenings yes. to be able to, combat issues. Okay. And I think that every single space, every single industry has a part to play in mm -hmm. decreasing the wealth gap. And so I just want people to be aware of that and start thinking about okay. innovative ways that they can impact it. Okay. What else? For me, and I've said this for a couple of years, yeah. uh, because I've been in the credit union space um, going on seven years now, okay. is people we need to put our money where our mouth is. Okay. And this is very little because we work for a financial institution. Okay. But what I mean is that we pay attention to what, we, what the food that we consume. We, pay, we, pay, we started to pay attention to the media that we consume. Okay. I think we also need to pay attention as to how are we investing and what financial institutions we are supporting. Okay. And how are they supporting community, underserved communities? communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's really comes down to the credit union difference. So the okay. credit union difference is people helping people. And so a way that people can show up is by paying attention what their financial institution is doing for underserved markets. For sure. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if, you know, folks say that they care about the, the investments and ongoing improvements to uh, the living and the livelihood of our neighbors of color, mm -hmm. that also starts with your financial institution. Okay. If you're banking, I'm not going to name any banks because I'm not going to be petty like that. <laughs> but... <laughs> But if you're, you know, you continue to choose your, to do all of your finances with major banks, but you don't look at what they're actually investing in. Yes. And then you you're kind of out of touch. Yeah. And it's a, mm -hmm. uh, you're essentially uh, supporting many practices that hurt communities of color. Oh, yeah. And that's why I, I'm, I'm, I continue to be a huge advocate for credit unions and obviously Green State because, um, the more we grow, 
as an, as an industry, yeah, the more we can commit and invest back in our communities. Okay. So what about this? Cause I kind of know the lowdown, right? Cause I've been in the credit union world myself <laughs> as a vendor per se, mm-hmm. right? right? Green state is the largest credit union in the state of Iowa. What, what do you guys say when somebody gives that as pushback? Why should I come to your credit union when you're already number one? Well, I think that with being number one, there's a great responsibility there. And so while we are the number one credit union in the state and the largest and the largest, yes, we're, and I, I don't have hard facts right now, but I would, I can go out on a limb and bet my next paycheck. Okay. <laughs> my Honor, next paycheck we're, we're that we give this. the most back to our, the communities okay. that we serve and that are in our field yeah. of membership. I actually believe you though. So, <laughs> yes. And I'm sure my, uh, our chief marketing officer can fact check that, but I'm, I'm confident in that we give back to our communities. Yes. And we also invest in learning more Correct. about our community. I would say that's very accurate. Yeah. I, I would add to, uh, to just holding us accountable Yeah, because at the end of the day, we are, as you mentioned, the largest. So we have, we are in a position to, to drive impact mm-hmm. and motivate other institutions to do the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and so by being our members, being part of our credit union, that's a, that's a, that's a perfect way to, to continue to hold us accountable, to continue to, to yeah. do the things that we say we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think that's part of the thing that's missing today is the accountability factor. Right. And I think people have a hard time with that word, right? Mm-hmm. Like people just don't know how to handle it anymore. Yeah. Right. Well, our leadership team is huge on accountability yes. and asking for our feedback and they don't mind when we push back on them and challenge and it's a part of our culture, right? Yeah. We are not mm-hmm. afraid to fail because through failure, we learn and we get better. Through failure is growth. Yes. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened with this initiative. Green State tried to enter the Latino immigrant market maybe a few years back okay. and they failed terribly. Okay. And they say that they're very candid about it. Okay. And so they put it on, they stopped what it, what it was that, that they were trying to do. Mm-hmm. And then when it came up in conversations again, I think late uh, 2020, um, our senior team was all on the same page that if they were going to try to do this again, that they were going to, they, they needed to be a hundred percent on board. Okay. It couldn't just be an initiative. Okay. We needed to be embedded in our practices and our decision-making. Okay. And so that's when they brought you in first, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So they brought you in in 2021? 2021. Yep. And then Lindsay came this year. Yeah. 2022. Okay. So what's happening now? What's going to happen in the, you know, what you guys are working for now? Well, now we are really focused, um, like I mentioned before, on that financial literacy piece. Yes. So we're looking to open our first Green State Financial Empowerment Center. Yes. And we want to place it in um, the 50314 neighborhood. Okay. As that has been a neighborhood that has been overlooked in central Iowa. The north side. The north. Well, I say it's down like central. Central north. Central north because it is very close to downtown. Yes. Like a lot of people that are going um, from the north to downtown have to pass right through it. Well, you have to cross over university. You have to cross over university. So that area has been largely ignored for financial investment, financial institutions, and just overall community support. Correct. We can attest to that because we actually made a bunch of videos for the city of Des Moines for their new north side community center project. Project. So mm-hmm. yes. Hunter and I actually put those videos together and we had to learn. We learned so much mm-hmm. about what happened in that, how that community back in the sixties and seventies was just popping. I mean, it was the mm-hmm. place to be. Mm-hmm. And then through the seventies, eighty or the eighties, nineties and the early two thousands, how a lot of neglect yes. took place. Yeah. Yes. So by placing it there, one, we are because we have been so focused on black and brown communities, and that is the majority in that space. It really provides access. Yeah. Because Kenya mentioned before, some of the biggest barriers for people to get to their financial institution is transportation. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a huge transportation issue across the state of Iowa. I would say that's fair. But even here in Des Moines. Yeah. People live 
where they can get the services that they need. So grocery, they, yes, banking, yes. Uh, even the dry cleaners when mm-hmm. it was popular back in the day. Well, and technically that area is a food desert because it only has a specialty grocery store. Yes. There is not a traditional grocery store Correct. in that zip code. But back in the day, back we the found day. out that there used to be 10 grocery stores mm-hmm. just in that zip code mm-hmm. alone. Yep. And so as people moved west... And or into downtown, I would say that area just has been just wildly forgotten and it needs it needs people to provide intention and services and support. And so um, that was our thought behind putting our financial empowerment center there. We want to focus on financial literacy. We want to help combat payday lending Mm -hmm. and eliminate it. That's we're going after them. Three thousand percent interest. People don't realize that. Yeah, it's in. They target people in neighborhoods Absolutely. where there aren't a whole lot of financial institutions. Correct. Yeah. So when is that supposed to be up and ready to go? So right now we're looking at quarter two of okay. 2023. Got it. Um, but we're, you know, as things move, you know, we're hoping that we will be able to move in by that date. We've had a, some challenges with supply chain issues as you, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's everybody, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> but yes, that is our, that's our targeted open data okay. so quarter to 2023. Is that where your office is going to be? No, unfortunately not. We're all over the place. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah, It wouldn't even be fair to that location for us to take some space because we, I mean, we're everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. That's really close to us. That would be super convenient to us. I can come in and be like, what up girls? (laughs) (laughs) You can still do that. Okay. 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 So, so that's supposed to be, you guys have picked the building, right? Yes. And you guys are redoing the building as we speak. The building has been redone. Okay. Um, we're repurposing a space. Initially, we okay. weren't a part of the project, and now we kind of we kind of came in late in the game, but we're here. Okay. And okay. So, like I said, just kind of working through some. So, uh, where's that's on the corner of Sixth? It's close to the corner of Sixth and University. Okay, there you go, guys. Pay attention, Sixth and University, <laughs> yes. sometime spring twenty twenty four. Yes, hoping. I mean twenty twenty three. My bad. We're hoping that. Um, this winter we'll have our space wrapped. Okay. So having some, uh, coming soon signage. Yeah. 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 Okay. That'd be great. What else is, is cracking off? Cause we gotta, we gotta wrap up here in a bit. So I guess like the next phase, the way that I would describe the next year okay. is living up to the promises that we have made. Okay. So at the mm-hmm. beginning you mentioned that we just, a lot of people don't know about this. Yes. And that's intentional. Okay. So we needed to do, uh, we needed to look internally to see what needed to be addressed internally before we went out to the public and made these promises Okay, that if we weren't ready, if our staff did not have the resources okay. and education, then we could again fail because we weren't able to meet the promises that we're trying to make. Okay. So now we've taken the last maybe 18 months to look at policies, procedures, training internally okay. and the makeup of our, of our staff. So now we feel that this, this next year and going forward is just really living up to those promises that we're so making. So it's going to be gangbusters. Yeah. yeah basically. Okay. Yes. yes. In conclusion. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so we have to wrap this up because Perfect. you know we we've taken a lot of time and and I want to get and I want to get to the meat of this is how do people get in touch with you guys to start having these conversations? So what's the best way to get in contact with you two? I would say always email. Okay, yes. So Tell us your emails. Lindsay Candidate at greenstate.org. And that's L I N D S A Y C A N N A D A Y at Greenstate. Dot O-R-G. We'll flash that at the bottom. Yes. So, and I, um, I would also say, add us on LinkedIn, to, even just to to keep up with everything that's going okay. on. Make sure to like um, and follow Green State and various social media social media platforms, okay. um, Facebook. Instagram, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter. Yes, all those. Yes, okay. Twitter. And, um, I think Lindsay and I are probably having a coffee meeting every single day just to get to get to know what other folks are working on yes exchange ideas so okay. we stay highly caffeinated and we can we in are, the community though. Yes, yes 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 and okay. so even if it's just somebody wanting to we we get these requests all the time i just love to learn a little bit more yeah yeah and that's what we do well and also with learning too we want people to ask us hard questions we yes. want to be able to take their hard questions back to our team and really 
work through them and make sure that we are comfortable answering it and also addressing it. Absolutely. Mm. So you guys do your research. Yeah. Especially if something is not living up to what we had promised. Okay. That's, we need to hear that feedback. I just heard that last week. I think somebody told me, Hey, this and this happened in this market and we need to be able to address it. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, you guys can email or visit their website. You can schedule a personal one-on-one time with you girls for some caffeinated time. Right. (laughs) And then just pay attention to all their socials and things like that. So absolutely. um, We have to wrap this up because Hunter keeps flashing me. So (laughs) stop it. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) I'll probably bring you guys back because this, this is, you know, what you guys are doing is not a one-off conversation, okay. truthfully. You know, yeah. I, I love what you guys are doing. This is, you know, I'm a kid that, that, you know, essentially came from nothing. Right. And so, and I'm used to seeing diversity, equity, inclusion, okay. and, and a hub spot of culture and things like that. I think what you guys are, do, are doing is, is dope. So I think this is what our community really needs and the empowerment behind it. So I'd love for you guys to come back on a different time and spend a little bit more time deep diving into this some more. And, and hopefully, you know, hopefully, you know, this helps as a piece of like, you know, fueling your mission. Absolutely. We always hope that someone will hear what we have to say Mm -hmm. and reach out with the questions. Yeah. Again, check out Kenya and Lindsay on their LinkedIn. Um, you can visit their website. You can email. Uh, you can email them because we will flash both of your emails because I got it both um, underneath here, and then that you guys can just reach out for any information. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. I very. I know you guys are super busy, so thanks for coming through. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All Thank right, you. and we out.